This is our, the first time in our nation's history that the House of Representatives has been without an elected speaker, and it's not going well. Yesterday, the House Republican Conference voted by secret ballot, that's key, to drop the election denier Jim Jordan as their nominee for speaker after Jordan failed on his third vote, where he set the record a second time for fewest votes received by a majority party's nominee for speaker. And here's the more important part. In the culture of violence that Donald Trump has nurtured in America and the Republican Party, some of the Republican members who publicly had voted against Jim Jordan, who was the Trump-backed choice, have now reported receiving death threats and phone calls and text messages with death threats in them for opposing Jim Jordan's candidacy. Even Kevin McCarthy, who is possibly the least effective House Speaker in modern history, has expressed deep concern about the party and what he calls the crazy eight chaos members of the Republican conference. Unfortunately, um, Jim is no longer going to be the nominee. We'll have to go back to the drawing board. What history will look at, the crazy eights led by Gates, the amount of damage they have done to this party and to this country <clears throat> is insurmountable. I've never seen this amount of damage done to just a few people for their own personalities, for their own fear of what's going through. And really, um, it's astonishing to me. And um, we are in a very bad position as a party. The House adjourned last night until Monday with no clear plan to elect a speaker next week, but with at least 10 Republicans considering a run. Look at this. I, it's hard to see, or maybe it's just hard to see because of my age. But underneath all of those pictures, we've put a little thing that says whether they voted to uphold the election of 2020 or to overturn. Eight of the people on this, on this picture of 10 are actual election deniers. Imagine that. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, the person right after the vice president in line for the presidency, having denied the actual legitimate election of that president. That's the Republican Party that we have right now, one that is self-cannibalizing as we speak, eating itself, one that is allowing the Chaos Caucus to undermine Congress's ability to do anything at all. So as President Biden calls on America to show its strength and its unity, as he calls on Congress to show the world what American leadership looks like, the Republican Party is stuck in a downward spiral. Joining me now is the former Republican representative from Pennsylvania, Charlie Dent. He's also the executive director and vice president of the congressional program at the Aspen Institute. And Joanne Freeman, professor of history and American studies at Yale University and author of The Field of Blood, Violence in Congress and the Road to the Civil War. Welcome to both of you. Joanne, I, I just, I've known you for a long time and I, I've always thought it'd be nice to talk. And, I, and every time I talk to you, it's because of something that is that serious. I just spoke to Ray Smock in the last hour, a historian of Congress, who says we've actually not been in a situation like this uh, since around the Civil War, where it, where it took 133 votes over several months to get a, a Speaker of the House. And that was about a war in which close to three quarters of a million Americans died, a civil war. Kevin McCarthy seems to have come to his senses after not being speaker to say this is insurmountable destruction uh, being being led by a, a bunch of Republicans on the House. And then, Joanne, there is violence on top of that. There's threats of violence. Don Bacon says his wife sleeps with a gun next to her, a Republican congressman, because of the threats they've received. I, I don't know what you make of this. <laughs> well, um, I guess I make two things about it. Number one, um, and I also, when I think about the current moment, I go back to 1856, which I'm sure is what Ray was talking about, a two-month battle to create a speaker, to, to elect a speaker, which was two months because slavery was the issue and it couldn't be compromised. And in the end, a new party, an anti-slavery party, the Republican Party, rises, and that indeed ends up being the way forward in politics at that time. So these kinds of speaker battles are a kind of snapshot of the nation. And what we're seeing now is a rise of extremism on the right, a good number of people on the right who are not pushing back, and a small number of people on the right who are. So number one, what that shows us is I think right where we are. There's not a stream of opposition to what's going on right now on the right. Um, and so for all that everyone keeps yelling that democracy is in danger, well, democracy is in danger. And if this is a snapshot, we're seeing that there is a little pushback, but not a lot of pushback to what 
could have been here a very dangerous moment. Charlie Dent, I guess the silver lining here, because that's the kind of guy I am always trying to find a silver lining, is that uh, Kevin McCarthy has been unshackled and is saying all the things out loud that he needs to. He's coined the crazy eight gang, uh, by, you know, crazy eights by Gates or whatever it is. You tweeted something. There's uh, Patrick McHenry is the speaker pro tem at the moment, and there's some uh, exercise in trying to get him in place until January 3rd so we can get through this government shutdown and we can pass bills. You tweeted, if pro tem empowerment fails, governing Republicans and Democrats should work together on a power sharing agreement and elect a bipartisan Speaker of the House. For people who live in parliamentary democracies, this is not an unusual thing. It's very unusual. It's, it's not actually ever happened, really, in America. But it's not an unusual thing in a lot of major democracies in the world. Tell me what you're thinking. Well, look, we've watched this session of Congress proceed where Republicans in the House needed Democrats to help them bring bills to the floor on the debt ceiling and the budget agreement. Couldn't have passed it without Hakeem Jeffries and the Democrats. They needed them. Same thing with this recent continuing resolution. Democrats were needed uh, to pass the, the, the most recent funding measure, keep the government open. Uh, I suspect we'll need the same sort of coalition to help elect the Speaker. And I keep looking at what happened in the Senate in the last session, where it was split evenly, 50-50, 50 Republican, 50 Democrat, Kamala Harris breaking ties. Well, they, the committees were evenly divided. Uh, Democrats chaired the committees, and they functioned on a consensus basis. Hey, it wasn't ideal for either side, but it worked. Maybe the House of Representatives is going to need to look at that model, 50-50 on the, on the uh, even Stephen on the, uh, on the committees, and then, uh, you know, then, and then try to function on a consensus basis and, and elect the speaker, you know, like McHenry, I still think that's a viable option, uh, that they, that they lead Democrats to make, to, to, to empower him. And by the way, I have a campaign slogan for Patrick McHenry, give me McLiberty or give me McDeath. But nevertheless, uh, that said, I think we should uh, we should look at that. There you go. I know you know your history. Uh, but uh, so there are less. Uh, but that's something we should look at. And by the way, one other thing, the irony of what Kevin McCarthy just said about he called him the crazy eight. I can make a strong case that Jim Jordan and a few others helped spawn that group. I mean, that group is very much with him. And then for Kevin McCarthy, then to strongly support Jim Jordan. Well, it's, it's that same wing. And what's, what we're watching. I, I'm with you. Well, yeah, but what you're uh, witnessing, no one I was awful it. confused by that, too. Um, yeah. it, it, the world's upside but, down. But, but, Ali, what you're witnessing in real time, though, is a fight between, I'll call the pragmatic institutional wing of the party and the much larger Trump populist wing. That's what we saw on the floor. Actually, that's a healthy fight. The institutionalists said, we cannot accept Jim Jordan. We, you know, we need a Congress that you know, can function, that can govern, and he's, he can't help us in that regard. And that was a, a useful fight. Now, obviously, with the world on fire, uh, this is not a good time to have the fight, but that's where we are. Joanne, you uh, had a webcast, uh, History Matters, with the National Council for History Education. It aired yesterday, and you tweeted about it. You wrote, quote, threats as politics, yes. Threats versus members of Congress voting against Jordan seem like a continuation of what some on the right have done for years. No, what's happening now is different, and it matters. Tell me what the, you mean by that. Well, there's two things that I want to make, uh, two points I want to make about that. Number one is that when I've been talking to people about these threats against members of Congress, what I've heard back very often is, well, yeah, that's what they do. What do you expect? So first of all, think about the degree of normalization that that suggests. The response isn't, this is bad, we need to resist it. The response is, well, yeah. Of course, I don't think people realize the degree to which that's an alarming response. But more than that, I think it's one thing and a horrible thing to be threatening um, people who work at polling places or members of school boards or a variety of other ways in which there have been people on the right threatening people either to get them to step down or to cooperate. What we're seeing now is those kinds of threats, that kind of violence, interwoven with the process of government. We have people trying to influence members of Congress to install the speaker that they like. That, to me, is a, a difference that needs to be realized. What you see is people trying to use violence to get what they want in Congress in a semi-coordinated way. That's alarming. 
You know, that's that's violence being interwoven with our political process in a dangerous mm -hmm. way. And I have to say, thank goodness, some people stood up and said, I've been threatened so that people know that it's happening, because unless it's exposed, it will keep going. Charlie, do you think that's a, a line that's been crossed and the, the people you talk to in the Republican Party believe that to be true? I mean, we've heard from Ken Buck about it. We've heard from Don Bacon, who's a, a, a you know, regular guest on this show, a real friend of our uh, show. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's very sad to know that his, his wife is being threatened. Uh, we've heard from Marionette Miller-Meeks, a Republican representative from Iowa, about the threats she's had. We, we heard from Mitt Romney about when the impeachment vote was on, that, that uh, a Republican senator was going to vote in favor of impeachment and was told, think of your children, think of your family, think of your safety. Is this, a, is this an actual red line? Yes, it is a red line. And the, the three members you mentioned, Bacon, Miller Meeks, and uh, Romney, are all very thoughtful, policy oriented people who are serious. Yes. And these aren't the people who are, these aren't gadflies. These aren't people who, 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 who cry, you know, who run crying about every little thing. They're serious people. And if they say they're being threatened, I'm, I'm really concerned about, about that. And, and, you know, it really must, it, it, it must end. But you know what, I think there's another problem here, uh, Ali, that we should uh, acknowledge, that those who are pushing back against the Bacons of the world are people who don't like to accept outcomes. So, for example, on the, on the, the speaker election, uh, Steve Scalise defeated Jim Jordan. And then that small rump wing undermined him immediately. He could not get 217 votes. They wanted their will. They wanted Jim Jordan. Well, they, they, they almost got him. Same thing on Ukraine funding. The House of Representatives wants to fund the Ukraine effort, but this small rump faction is preventing the majority from bringing up a vote. And of course, there's January 6th. When they didn't like the outcome of the presidential election, what did they do? They tried to decertify. See the pattern here? They, they don't. Some of these people do not accept outcomes, legitimate outcomes. You know, so you yeah. know, a vote on the floor on Ukraine funding should settle the matter. <laughs> you know, that's how it should, should work. Or you know, Scalise well, defeating Jordan should the settle the. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I just want to add to what you're saying. Not accepting outcomes is democracy. Democracy is contests with outcomes. People who are not accepting outcomes are not accepting democracy. And that, again, that that as you just said is a red line. We're going to put that, uh, put a pin in it there because that's uh, that's amazing. Not accepting outcomes is democracy. Appreciate you both. Thank you for being here always for us. Uh, former Congressman Charlie Dent and Joanne Freeman, Professor of History and American Studies at Yale University. I, I take that back. Don't, don't, not thanks for being here. Thanks for being here for the country because we need voices like yours. <laughs>